Okay, I think we can uh, um, move on to the, um, the next talk, which is uh, by Duncan Massey and uh, a couple of co-authors. So thanks, Duncan, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, low-frequency airborne EM, airborne IP. Uh, we'll be using, looking at uh, B sensors as well as DBDT sensors. Firstly, I would just like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, uh, Paul Rogerson, um, who, has, who is responsible for a lot of the avionics of this system. So he's been responsible for designing of the loop, uh, getting the sensors up in the air, and keeping everything up in the air, we hope. Uh, Jim McNay, he's been responsible for a lot of the technical background, a lot of the rotation software, and obviously we'll be using an armoured sensor, which is Jim's little baby here. We've previously heard from a couple of speakers who've been discussing airborne IP, and they discussed about the identification of IP, and they've looked at ways that, well, the airborne IP initially was always thought to be just a negative decay, but some of them have mentioned that it can be a steepening, so it's not necessarily always negative. They've discussed the importance of not only including the frequency dependency in the conductivity model, which is required then to give you an accurate geological model. model. Uh, Jim McNair yesterday was talking about some of the sources of IP, and these were included uh, permafrost, weathered regolith, potentially clay, but the, probably the most important uh, response was those arising from alteration zones surrounding mineralisation. But the notable exception of all these lists of APOL and IP sources was from economic grade mineralisation. So it wasn't seen to be that it was detecting directly uh, economic grade uh, IP sources. So it's a bit to this goal that this presentation will focus. So just a bit of an overview about um, how we're going to, I suppose, what we need to do to get a B and a DBDT field airborne IP system. So we'll have a quick brief talk about what's so good about airborne induced polarisation. So why do we want to try and measure it? We'll then look at why B field is maybe in preference to an induction sensor. We'll re report on some of the early experiments. Some of them you may have seen before. Some certainly have not been unreported. The Amira project will be briefly mentioned. That's where a lot of the early work was completed for this uh, airborne system. Obviously, there's a lot of technical problems that are going to come apart from recording B-field as distinct from induction. We'll have a quick look at rotation corrections. The system, which we call a BIPTEM, so for B-field, induced polarisation and TEM, that's where we hope to put all of the above points into a reality and make it supply. And then some data from Lewis Ponds, which is acquired with a fixed loop. So first, why consider airborne induced polarisation? Well, well, I suppose those disseminated sulphides beneath conductive cover, they don't represent a very strong conductive target. So if you want to be able to detect them, you really would go for IP. Um, and ground IP, well, it's the most important geophysical method for finding these porphyry sulphide explorations. If you're doing ground surveys, you do have some issues. You do have contact problems in desert areas. You know, it's a lot of mobilisation, it's a fair amount of kit. And certainly what's starting to come apart in Australia, maybe in the world, there are now starting to become quite uh, significant safety restrictions using those high voltages. As the transmitters get larger and larger, it's a non-insignificant risk that's coming through from these transmitters. So if we can fly it and detect reliably uh, IP effects, that's got to be an improvement. Um, so, now, so we're looking at some of the physical properties of sulphides. So the slide on the yep, left shows we're looking at, I suppose, the sensitivity of a ground uh, IP survey, which is operating at 8 seconds or 0.125 of a hertz. 
and we're looking at the, the phase or the observed phase response um, and then comparing against chargeability and the time constant. And we can see that if we look at a coal coal model with a C equals uh, 0 0.3, which is sort of typical of most economic mineral zones, the sensitivity, which is in shaded, uh, extends over from milliseconds up to, well, it's a log scale, days. So we can see the ground system is quite sensitive to a quite a wide, wide range of uh, time constants. On the alternatively, if we look at an airborne IP system, and they typically run at around the 25 hertz, and we would model that up as a maybe a one semen uh, thin sheet surface, which would be convolved then with a induced polarization response. Its sensitivity is in red, and you can see then that it's limited to milliseconds. There's not a significant overlay in terms of those time constants between the ground surveys and the airborne IP surveys. Then when we look across to the right, we can start seeing now where you would plot some of the more economic grade zones. And so we can see in yellow the clusters of, uh, for the gold, and we can see all of the sulphides as well. And you can clearly pick where the halo is, which is down low, which is where the sensitivity is for an airborne IP. It's not really mapping those zones of mineralization. There's got to be a way to be able to move the airborne IP system so we start to actually include or be able to detect um, economic mineralization. So why B-field? Why not stick with our induction sensors? Well, a quick uh, example, if we look at the slide on the left, we're comparing for a half space response, which is the dotted lines. Uh, which is decaying at t to the minus 3 on 2 and mi minus 5 on 2 for an induction sensor. And if we had a ore body buried at depth, it distorts the shape of the sounding curve. Um, I don't have a pointer, but I'm sure you can guess where the, the distortion occurs. And if you look at on the, if you were measuring a B field and you're looking at where the background, or where the, the amplitude increased by about 30% above the half space response and looked at where that occurred in time. You can clearly pick in the B field, it's almost an order of magnitude earlier in time than when you would see it in the BDT. So if we could measure B field, it allows us to reliably detect conductors earlier than if we were looking at DBDT. For airborne IP, when we're looking at the IP response, we get that classical negative dipping structure. The B field not only has the higher amplitude, but more importantly, it's occurring earlier in time. That zero crossover, it's possibly not quite an order of magnitude, but it has occurred earlier in time. So B field would intend to apply, that's the better style of sensor. You could think about whether you'd want to integrate a DBDT sensor to try and get, calculate the B. I think Jim mentioned it yesterday as well and showed a particular slide that the BDT sensors at very low frequencies have almost hit system noise. Integrating something with one bit, not gonna yield you the best results. So probably better to have a go at attempting to measure B directly. It's not to say that hasn't, people have not attempted to fly B fields before. Just a quick potted history. BHP flew squids back in the 1990s, Spectrum flew some in the year 2000. So the results have been encouraging. To my knowledge, I don't think there are any commercial operations of them flying. There's been many undisclosed issues. I would guess probably slew rates when the motion of the sensor flying through the air and the very rapid changes that you would see um, probably has not worked very well with the, uh, the flux lock loops of those, causing them to flux hop. Uh, the total field systems like Helisam Yep, well they are probably a bit more invariant to rotation, but they're only measuring one component um, of the Earth's field. Flux gates, a cheap and cheerful sensor, uh, does a really simple got a job of work. We'll show you some examples of the flux gate. So, flying, well this is actually the first flight that we tried with uh, the Armit sensor. It was uh, inside a somewhat, what we thought was quite a good shell and a good suspension system. 
The arm at B field sensor is up in the top left. Now the loop was a 100 by 100 meter loop and we just flew over the top at about a height of 40 to 50 meters. Um, you can see that the transmitter... Do we have a pointer? We can see that the, uh, the hair, well, we'll call on the left hand side, is actually when the sensor is over the top of the loop, and then we pass through and we continue on out. Probably the take home message from this particular picture is that our motion induced noise, which is just the sensor swaying in the wind, is almost the same amplitude as our signal. If we go to the flux gate, now the flux gate was not mounted in a the same a uh, rotationally damped platform as the armet, so it's a bit unfair on the, on the flux gate, but you can clearly pick the DC offsets. You really can't see any indication that there's a transmitter going, which would be in the same area. And if we look at the DBDT side of the armet sensor, straight away very clear, very easy picking of the, uh, the signal, and although Clearly, there's a uh, quite a thick band there. The signal well is uh, well outside the ro any of the rotation noise. The BDT sensors aren't as sensitive to motion. Uh, pick some spherics and some VLF. But we can see that there's a job of work to be done on the B fields if it's to come up and be useful. On this particular sensor, we on this particular flight, there were no efforts to measure rotation. So what we tried was just post-processing, so just very, uh, I'd say very coarse algorithms, uh, curve fitting style approaches to attempt to remove or reduce the, uh, the motion noise. They really worked quite well. Um, now we can see the signal is well outside any event noise, which has been reduced by quite a significant percentage. They did rely, the algorithms would only work if your suspension system was working correctly. You couldn't afford for the sensor to be jolting too rapidly within the field. It had to be well damped. Um, we would find that our sensor would oscillate at below, well below two hertz, probably one hertz and less. So that allowed these algorithms to do a fairly good job of work. Applying the same algorithm to the flux gate, we start to see some of the signal in here, but I'd almost defy you to know that it was going at some stages. If we then go along and actually extract what we knew normally used to seeing, which are just the sounding curves, plot them as a profile, uh, the arm at DBDT, uh, that's where the edges of the loop is, so that's the Z component and that's the along path uh, for the Y component. Quite nice, quite clean. Um, should say that this was actually at an airport, so we're not really expecting to see super quiet data, but not a bad outcome straight off. Um, no target there to be seen. It was really just a flight test to see how we were going to go with it and what our um, sensitivity was. The flux gate, okay, good. It does pick up that field, the primary part of it, but once we go outside to any significant distance, this is probably five or so hundred metres, um, you're not really picking up much outside. So the flux gate was, and it also, the rotation algorithms didn't work so well. We can see we've got a large DC offsets, which implying some level of drift still left within the data. But you compare it to the arm at B field, and you can sort of see why we would decide that the arm at B field is the one that's worth pursuing. Very long responses, as we say, when we're out 500 metres on beyond the fixed loop, still he healthy signals, particularly in the Y component. This could keep going on and on and on. Obviously, we're not saying that this is the final result. We need to do more because we're still getting lots of rotation noise coming through at late time. But still, incredibly encouraging that the B field is a very viable sensor and looking good. But more work. The Amara project, um, probably don't need to read too much about it. Um, something that Jim has worked with. There were quite a few sponsors to the whole thing. Where they were looking at flying E sensors, 
B sensors, DBDT sensors, all looking at this, can we actually measure the IP response directly? Uh, make it a useful product, not just necessary equal. There were some flight tests flown. The whole thing languished because one particular company didn't fare so well. It's all up and running again now. Um, so we're going to have a look at some of those results. So we're looking at low frequency. I should say that all these examples and all the data plots I put up are all 12 and a half hertz. So we've dropped in well below the 25 hertz of most normal systems and we're putting up 12 and a hertz data. That seems to be where we need to be, so why look at 25 if we want to get to 12? We also have flown some 3 hertz data as well, and that's still a bit of a work in progress, but we're certainly operating at low frequencies. So this slide was just talking about what's needed to be able to acquire this low frequency vector airborne um, EM. We want the three components. We don't just want a fixed loop. So we've seen that rotation noise takes off at low frequency. So our damping systems set it all below one one hertz. Because we're low frequency, it means that you can't stack as much. If you want to try and preserve some form of lateral resolution, you can't afford to be stacking too much or else you're losing too much of that lateral resolution. The DBDT sensors, well, we know that they've got decreased sensitivity for those long time constants. That's just a known. So we want to have that B field stuff. So some of the solutions that we've resolved on, the better suspension. So we've come up with a very nice, elegant way to suspend the arm suspension while it's flying. Um, more transmitter current, everybody loves current. So we've got to go bigger and better. Uh, the the BIPTEM system we're looking at will be greater than a, a million um, amp meters squared. Uh, we're going to use the B-field sensors inside the BIPTEM and we need to be able to correct for noise. So really the BIPTEM is the, air, is the name of the airborne platform that we hope to put all of this and make it all into a reality. Oh, don't want to harp on too much, but if we're going to look at rotation corrections, one of the very first things we need to be able to do is actually measure the rotation. We can't just rely on software and try and correct for it either. So this is a very quick little cartoon which is tries to sort of show you that if you do have an arm at sensor or any form of sensor, now this is only showing you the vertical component. There are, which are what we say is the AZ, there's four of them. If you want to measure the X sensors, there'll be four in those orientations and the Y as well. So the armament is actually a cube. But just to simplify things down, we'll only look, consider the AZ or the vertical component. We have a direction for the, uh, the B field. <coughs> and you can see that you can break down the Earth's field into, just using basic trigonometry, into several components. Um, so... I suppose one thing to see from this is that the vertical component is quite invariant to rotation, I suppose what we would call yaw, so anything rotating back and forth, it doesn't see, but it will see that it's tilting back and forth or left and right. Okay, so we can see that for our vertical component, it is only really seeing problems as it's tilting back and forth. Three minutes. Ooh, well, I better speed this whole thing up. Uh, so, rotation sensors uh, from the manufacturer, sorry, I, should, I call them rotation, but they're really rotation rate sensors. They form a curve like this, this is their sensitivity, frequency over amplitude. The armet, which all, you may or may not know, you'd need to know, get into the technical, does have a corner frequency below which the armet operates closer to a DBT sensor and above which it's closer to a B-field sensor. But the armet at like, these low frequencies where we're seeing Rotation issues is matching very well the rotation rate sensors. Data plot, uh, the B field, this is the noise associated with the rotation, matches that of the rotation rate sensors which are mounted onto the armament. Sorry, I need to sort of speed up along. So if we look at these rotation rate sensors, this would be a typical style of response. We need to integrate them to be able to give us the rotation. Now obviously integration on low frequency data can have a bit of a runaway effect. If we break down this into its, the cosine and sine components, we still have this sort of low frequency drifting of this integration. But when we apply the armet response to it, which has, being an induction magnetometer, has no DC, or it actually straightens back out and we end up with abilities to see, or be able to predict 
from the rotation a B field response. So how does it look? If we measure the rotation, the three directions, and in black there we can see the actual measured data and the red curves are the predicted data based on the rotation rates. So just the rotation rates, the basic trigonometry, you had to solve a linear least squares with a few basis functions, but you get the ability to be predicting the B field response based on pure rotation rates. If you can do that, then you can subtract one from the other and hopefully, hey presto, it's all going to work. This is a shaker table uh, example, not an airborne one. If we turn on a transmitter, we get the same style of thing that we can predict in red curves based on the rotation rates where the sensor is going. Let's zoom through. So just looking at one stack here on the left is just the raw data coming off. The one in the middle when we predict the noise and remove the noise. What's left is a DC offset, which is very, the very low frequency that the predictions are not predicting. We can subtract that away and suddenly you're reducing your noise from what is a quite a broad band into a very narrow band width. So... To date, we've constructed the new housings. We've got our resonant uh, rotations below a hertz. We've flown quite a few different bird designs. We're collecting quite good airborne EM data. That actually is the BIPTEM system up in the air with the armament suspended in the middle, the large transmitter loop that actually just flew two days ago. So it's quite zero time. <laughs> uh, can I do a couple more? You can do a couple more. You're just cutting into your question time. Oh, that's right. I'd rather show you something than talk to questions. So the armor can either be flown in this mode or <coughs> as a single bird and with a fixed loop sensor. Jim showed you some of these slides before. Again, and what we want to get, ignore, ignore. Probably the final best one, 12 and a half hertz data, a B field response. And we can see with all the rotations, everything's starting to be stripped out. We're starting to get very clean, very quiet off time data. Uh, and when we apply it to our Lewis Ponds examples, we start to pick up small little negative IP responses, which are coincident with ground IP responses. They don't reflect a uh, halo effect or offset from the link. They are actually matching the measured ground response. That's quite an encouraging little thing. Still pointing out 12 and a half hertz. Inclusions, that's what they all are. Um, so we can see that we're going well at measuring our B field. We've got our low frequency data. It's going to be better for the airborne EM, irrespective of whether there's IP or not. Lower frequencies, deeper penetration. Um, yeah, that will do me. Thank you. Questions? Well, we can't with the armored sensor measure the total field. It has no DC response. Well, the rotational rate sensors are extremely accurate. Um, that said, we're making some fairly good assumptions on the B field, the Earth's B field. If those assumptions aren't right as to drift or orientation, then sure, we're going to be in a bit of problem. So it may be, and it's some of the reasons why we wanted to put, keep the flux gate along for the ride, is to help the improve the original estimates of the Earth's field. If that's wrong, then you can see from that basic trigonometry errors start to propagate and keep carrying through. So what you're suggesting is probably quite a valid addition to allow to you to quantify those rotation rate sensors. But I th you probably need both. Uh, the flux gates were just standard Bartingdon, so six picotesla per root hertz, so nothing, nothing exotic at all. The sample rate for this one, we were running at 156 kilosamples per second, 12 channels. Roughly 400 megabytes per minute, 25 gigabytes were coming through every hour. Quite a lot of data that we got stuck with. Um, Jim didn't appreciate all the data that was sent to him, but sample rates are high. We could go faster again, up to 312, but not sure we're seeing the point going any faster than 156. It's pushing the envelope on the sensitivity of the armament sensor. Rotation rates, they're limited to 100 hertz, so why sample so fast? But for the initial work, great believer in oversampling, you can always reject it after the fact. 